É, boa tarde a todos. É, é um prazer é, é, estar aqui com vocês. É o nosso segundo webinar internacional. É, nos sentimos assim muito honrados de, de ter a participação de tantos colegas e profissionais da área. É importante que a gente se mantenha ativo nesse período de quarentena, em que provavelmente a gente está fazendo só atendimento por telemedicina. Então, a importância de debater temas de relevância, seja temas relacionados com o coronavírus, mas também temas de importância é, primordiais para a nossa prática diária. Então, é, é, nossa ideia foi convidar o doutor é, Danilo Simadomo, né, que é o, a Natália vai fazer a introdução dele, em inglês, e falar sobre um tema extremamente relevante que atinge uma população bastante importante na nossa prática clínica, que são os pacientes com é, idade materna avançada, PGT, PGTA, e que eventualmente só tenham embriões de baixa, baixo potencial de qualidade. Então, é, 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 essa é o nosso segundo webinar internacional e nós, no final, vamos fazer o um anúncio do nosso terceiro webinar internacional, que vai ser na sexta-feira da semana que vem e a gente já, já vai postar, já vai mostrar o convite. Então, eu vou passar a palavra para a Natália Prats, que é a, a embriologista-chefe da Clínica Origem e a gente vai ter algumas pessoas que vão fazer perguntas. A Renata Boss, que é embriologista-chefe da Origem de BH, Teremos o Dr. Selmo Geber, que é diretor clínico da clínica Origem de BH. E teremos também a doutora Rafaela Batiste, que é, que é médica aqui da clínica Origem Rio, para poder aquecer o debate e as perguntas posteriormente. Então, Natália, está com você agora. Ok. Olá, boa tarde a todos. Sejam todos bem-vindos ao nosso terceiro webinar né, da clínica Origem. Eu convidei o Dr. Danilo Simadomo, que ele é biólogo molecular e embriologista. Ele é coordenador científico do Grupo Genera, na Itália. Eu tive o prazer de conhecê-lo numa visita que eu fiz agora, ao Genera, em fevereiro. E ele vai falar pra gente sobre o potencial reprodutivo dos blastocistos de, de baixa qualidade. Convidei também a Roberta Madiuli que ela é supervisora do laboratório de Roma, lá do Grupo Genera, e ela vai estar à disposição no final da apresentação do Danilo para responder a perguntas de como que está a situação do laboratório é, frente à pandemia, como está sendo a atuação deles, se eles é, já estão voltando, como eles estão voltando, quais os cuidados, ela então vai estar disponível após a apresentação para as perguntas. Danilo, hi! Thank you very much for accepting this invitation. I'm very pleased that you accepted it and that you are bringing us quality information and sharing your knowledge with us during this difficult time, especially in Italy and all around the world. So thank you once again, and I will pass it over to you. Thanks, thanks for having us here. I think I can speak also for uh, Roberta. It's a great pleasure for us to be part of this webinar. And uh, so let's get it started. I will share my screen. So Natalia, can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, so I can start. So, uh, Here, I summarize in a way the different topics, uh, the agenda of my presentation, the things we should and will uh, be talking about. Uh, we start with a brief review of the impact of aneuploidies in uh, human reproduction. So this is a paper that we recently published uh, in Science last year. The uh, principal investigator was Professor Eva Hoffman in uh, uh, Copenhagen. It was a multi-center study that involved several uh, IVF centers and academic centers. And the idea was to draw this line that you can see here, which, is, which stands for the rate of euploidies in human eggs. The nice thing of this study is that by using also the ovarian tissue preserved in cancer patients as young as nine years old and IVF patients as old as 45, we could in a way draw which is the line of euclides is in, in human oocytes. And as you can see, differently from what we expected, there is a U shape and a non-J shape. In other terms, 
the risk of aneuploidies in uh, patients, women, babies just before puberty is actually the same as women uh, before menopause. Now we know that this has an influence on the euploidy, uh, euploid blastosis rate, which is about, uh, uh, we have an euploidy rate of about 25-30% in, in also in very young women of about 35 years old, and then it decreases down to 9-5% when we are very close to menopause. And this kind of curve here, now we know that in a way is shaping the entrance and the exit of women in the window of fertility, which reaches uh, its highest peak in about mm, range between 25 and 30 years old. The risk of aneuploidies in, uh, in women, now we know it's clearly mirrored in the decrease in, uh, in uh, fertility as well as in the increase of uh, uh, miscarriage, in miscarriage, so in negative outcomes uh, uh, of spontaneous pregnancies. Now we know that this impact of aneuploidies is not just limited to spontaneous conception, but it affects also what we uh, every day say daily see in our uh, practice in uh, IVF. These are the data from our own concept in general. So what the, actually the patients sees and, uh, and uh, signs. And as you can see, the risk of aneuploidies uh, in more than 9,000 blastoids biopside increases uh, with the maternal age as uh, also the risk for those patients to not find uh, transferable embryos uh, uh, increases because of both a consequence of a reduced ovarian reserve and an increased aneuploidy rate. So this is actually what we could also confirm in our practice. But once we can find at least one transferable embryo euploid, regardless of woman age, so beyond the border of woman age, the chance of implantation of that embryo, it's actually the same. So it's more difficult to find at least one transferable embryo but once we had found that embryo, uh, it has the same uh, chance of implantation as uh, uh, in, in women older than 43 as for women younger than 34. And the good thing is that uh, also the miscarriage rate never goes beyond 14-15% when we transfer a euploid blastocyst. So implicitly, this is telling us that we should try in our clinical practice to uh, increase the number of oocytes uh, that we collect as much as possible. So in this nice paper by Barash that was published in Human Reproduction in 2017, he could cluster the results of uh, euploid blastocyst rate according to uh, increasing dosage of gonadotrophins and maternal age. And uh, as you can see, uh, the uh, euploidy rate, the bl euploid blastocyst rate decreases with the maternal age, but it does not decrease, it's not affected by how much, how, how high is the dosage that we use to stimulate the ovaries to produce oocytes. And also when we cluster the results according to the ovarian response to stimulation, collecting uh, less than five eggs or more than 15 eggs is not having an effect, uh, an effect on what is the chance of each uh, blastocyst to be euploid. So implicitly, uh, this is telling us that as we increase the number of uh, uh, embryos that we, blastocysts that we could produce in any IVF cycle, the highest would be the chance for that patient to uh, obtain at least one transferable embryo. Uh, in, a, in a utopistic uh, virtual situation, if we obtain at least 10 blastocysts, uh, we would have at least one embryo uh, transferable uh, also in patients uh, older than 40. So we know how difficult it would be to achieve this outcome, but the idea is that uh, the uh, higher the number of embryos that we obtain, the higher would be the chance to have at least one transferable embryo. In a paper that we published also in 2018 in human reproduction, we also noticed that there is no correlation between the euploidy rate and also the phase of the menstrual cycle in which we start the ovarian stimulation. Adopting a double stimulation approach in the, in the same ovarian cycle, the dual steam protocol that we are adopting currently and since 2016 in our clinics for patients older than 40 years or in general poor prognosis patients, if we compare the euploid blastocyst rate of uh, embryos obtained uh, from the follicular phase and the luteal phase in the same woman, just 15 days are spanning the two different oocyte retrievals they are performing, the chance that those embryos are euploid is absolutely not related even with the phase of the, of the ovarian cycle, we uh, stimulate the ovaries. 
And lastly, uh, we also conducted a study to see whether the severe male factor is in a way affecting the chance of uh, uh, an embryo to be euploid. In this paper we published in 2017, together with Rossella Mazzilli, who is our andrologist uh, at Genera, uh, we performed two different kinds of uh, logistic regression analysis. The first was to see which was the chance of a couple to obtain at least one euploid blastocyst to transfer. Well, in that case, the male factor, as well as the maternal age and the number of oocytes that we retrieved, are all compounding factors on these outcomes. But once the blastocyst is obtained, we have a blastocyst in front of us, it's just the maternal age and the quality of the blastocyst to be a confounding factor on the chance that that embryo would be employed. In other terms, uh, it uh, seems that the male factor is uh, absolutely important for the fertilization and the blastulation rate, but once we have the blastocyst, is not any more important for the chance of that blastocyst to be euploid. But as I told you, instead, it pops up that the blastocyst quality is uh, uh, relative. It, it has at least a mild correlation with the chance of an embryo to be euploid. And so we get to the point of this, uh, of this presentation. So in this um, slide, I summarize which is the um, classification that uh, method, the scheme that we use at Genera to uh, rate our blastocyst. So we tend, uh, we have two, three different parameters, expansion, ICM, so inner cell mass morphology, and trophectoder morphology. Uh, this method is adapted from the well-known Gardner and Schoolcraft uh, scheme that uh, many people uh, know from 1999 and are used. So what we tend to biopsy at our center in, uh, in Rome, it's, and in at general, in general, is embryos that look like this, which are blastocysts and fully expanded blastocysts. In some cases, uh, a lower rate of blastocysts may be biopsied also when they are in arching blastocysts. So we tend to avoid fully arched blastocysts, although they might still be biopsied, but we tend to avoid that kind of situation. And if we have an embryo that looks like this, that is a blastocyst, but it is not already expanded, we tend to wait up to uh, this stage, so what we call the C stage. Then we have embryos uh, that are classified according to their morphology of the ICM and the trophectoderm. If we have 1-1, one, one, it's an excellent quality blastocyst. 1-2 uh, two or 2-1, two, it's a good. 2-2, two, 1-3 two, one, three or 1-3 one, three or 3-1, three, it's average. And lastly, we have what we call the poor quality blastocyst that are those embryos that according to Garden and uh, Schoolcraft are classified as lower than BB. So the, in, in our classification method, they are the free free, the free two, and the two free, the, the poor quality blastocyst. Now we have a quick mm, look at what we published in 2014. So we saw the data, the euploid data clustered according to the quality of this end. So excellent, good, average, and poor. And as you can see, the euploid blastocyst rate decreases as the quality of the blastocyst decreases. There is a mild correlation. So from 56% down to 25% for the poor quality. So, but the point is that although there is this correlation, still we cannot base ourselves only on the quality of the embryo, since an embryo that is of an excellent quality, still one out of two might be a euploid, while embryos of a poor quality that in many countries are discarded just because they look bad, one out of four might be euploid and therefore uh, retain chances of implantation. Now, in Italy, the law forces us to use this embryo. So we cannot discard absolutely by law any embryo that shows signs of viability. So even though they look very bad, as soon as they are not degenerated, we must use these embryos clinically. So in, thanks in a way to this law, we could grow experience on poor quality embryos. Differently from uh, the rest of the world, many countries in which instead these embryos are just discarded. They are not even analyzed because of their uh, poor morphology. Now to stress this point, uh, I showed you this, uh, in this slide a review by Dean Morbeck that was published in Human Reproduction Open. He was reviewing all the different papers that instead gave us some clinical evidence uh, of uh, using poor quality blastocysts. Well, as you can see, uh, the prevalence of C quality, so what we call free quality for the inner cell mass, it's never higher than 10% all over in the world. The only Italian study here by Minasi in 2016 has twice as high uh, prevalence of 
poor quality third factor than in Italy with respect to the rest of the world. But this does not mean that in Italy we are making worse quality blastocysts. It's just telling you that we are forced to include these embryos and therefore the prevalence of poor quality blastocysts among our embryos is higher. And the same applies to the trophectoderm. So the prevalence of C quality trophectoderm, which in the world is about, if not lower than 20%, in Italy can get up to 35%. So this is the reason why uh, we uh, could grow experience on poor quality blastocysts. The good thing with uh, Morbeck and that we absolutely share his opinion is that he says that uh, the embryos, the blastocysts that rate poorly using conventional uh, scoring can result in normal live births, not just in our centers in Italy, but in any uh, report from, uh, uh, I mean, worldwide. And this indicates that probably in art clinics, we should reevaluate the threshold criteria that we use to define an embryo, uh, viable or not viable. In other terms, the answer to the question, is this blastocyst good enough to be used, may depend on patient circumstances, the values, the resources, which is the cycle that patients uh, come to us, our prognosis and things like this. It's not anymore just based on the embryo itself. So if uh, for this reason we, you know, we started to uh, produce some data uh, dealing with poor quality blastocysts, we published this paper in 2018. The paper was focused on inconclusive chromosomal analysis. So those kind of chromosomal analysis on blastocysts do not result in a, in a conclusive diagnosis. So because of DNA amplification failure, that means that we have no DNA in our tube, or because of non-concurrent results, which means that the DNA is inside the tube, but the quality of the genetic testing was insufficient to give a result. Now, the prevalence of this kind of result that then require a rebiopsy, so we need to rebiopsy these embryos that do not get a diagnosis, it's about 2.5%. But if we see these results clustered according to the quality of the blastocyst, you can see that poor quality blastocysts do not have a higher risk not to get a diagnosis. In our multi-center study on uh, more than uh, uh, 9,000 blastocysts, we could see that the risk not to get a diagnosis was even lower with respect to excellent quality. So you can easily biopsy these embryos and get a diagnosis. A risk instead, uh, uh, important risk, uh, deals with uh, the non-survival, so the degeneration after warming to these embryos. So probably we stress them too much and they might degenerate after warming. But this is not uh, an extremely high risk because as you can see, the risk of uh, non-survival is about six to seven percent for poor quality blastocyst, although it is just 0.5 percent for all other qualities of the blastocyst. So we need to take into account that they have not a risk uh, to uh, need a rebiopsy, but once we warm these embryos, they might degenerate to, uh, with, with a higher um, prevalence. So all this preliminary data led us uh, to uh, this paper that is only focused on uh, poor quality blastocysts that we published last year in, uh, in human reproduction. So we focus only on these embryos, uh, uh, as you can see uh, among more than uh, 6,000, almost uh, 7,000 blastocysts, the poor qualities were uh, about 22%. So this is just to tell you how high is the prevalence of these embryos in the court of blastocysts that we daily produce in our centers. But the nice thing, uh, which is extremely important in my opinion, is that the prevalence of poor quality blastocysts increases with maternal age. So it gets from less than 20% to up than 30%. So in women older than 42, one out of three of the blastocysts that we produce might be of poor, of poor quality. And we know how important it is to produce a higher number of blastocysts, especially in these patients. So this is uh, something that we should absolutely take into account. Now, poor quality blastocysts are slower with respect to good quality ones. They reach this stage more frequently in day six or day seven. When we biopsy them, the euploid rate is half with respect to good quality blastocysts. So we pass from 50 to less than 25%. But luckily, this kind of aneuploidies do not concentrate uh, among vital trisomies or sex chromosome aneuploidies. They only concentrate among mainly monosomies and complex aneuploidies. So this is something 
important in case you are going to use these MRIs, although I discourage this without PGT. So once we have a poor quality blastocyst of uh, uh, a euploid poor quality blastocyst with respect to a euploid non poor quality blastocyst, even the chance to get a baby at the end is lower. So we pass from about 50% to about 10%. So these embryos are uh, less competent. They develop uh, to the blastocyst stage uh, with um, a lower developmental rate. So they are slower. And they are even less competent, but still one out of 10 of these euploid poor quality blasts might become a baby. So we try to estimate how important this rate is for patients. So if you do not include poor quality blasts among the cohort of embryos that you use in your clinical practice, you will lose about 2.5% of chance that your patients might uh, get pregnant at the end of the day. And this rate is increasing in women older than 42, because as you can see here, and I showed you before, they account for one third of the embryo that you produce. So it might get up to 5%. So especially, and this is, these were our conclusions, especially for uh, poor prognosis patients, uh, poor responders, patients producing less than uh, free blastocysts or patients older than 42, uh, the um, clinical importance of poor quality blastocysts is definitely higher. Here we showed just a few of the, of the um, uh, pictures of these poor quality embryos that at the end of the day were euploid and that uh, resulted in a live birth, in a healthy live birth once transferred. So I showed these pictures to several uh, colleagues uh, worldwide and they told me we would have discarded these embryos, we, we would have never biopsied embryos like this. So this is just to give you an idea of which kind of embryos we are talking about. So now I move to other kinds of classification of poor quality. So we do not have only uh, a definition of poor quality embryos based on morphology itself, but sometimes also day seven blastocysts might be considered of a poor quality just because they are slower in their developmental rate. An interesting uh, review was performed by the group again of Dean Morbeck, Elizabeth Hammond was the first name in human reproduction in 2018. She was reviewing all the papers that uh, were analyzing uh, day seven blastocysts. So as you can see, they are count just for 5% of the population of embryos that we produce every day. So it's not uh, an increasing uh, an, an extremely high number of embryos, but still they account for 5%, which is a good number. The UPD rate is lower. It's, it's lower with respect to what we expect normally. Uh, it is about 34% rather than 50, uh, but still they might be euploid. And if vitrified and warmed, they have a chance to survive warming, which is about 95% from all these studies. When you transfer day seven embryos, they have a chance to result in a live birth of 40%. So they are absolutely viable, they're absolutely competent. So there is uh, a, rush, a, a good rationale in uh, extending embryo culture up to day seven, trying to rescue some embryos that might be useful to achieve a live birth. And these were also the conclusions from uh, Hammond and colleagues, they say that overall culturing an embryo one additional day, uh, uh, it's, it's probably uh, extremely important for pre prognosis patients that require uh, to increase their chance of uh, achieving a live birth. The data were also um, showed, similar data were also showed by the group of Richard Scott in New Jersey. TX was the uh, first name. The paper was published in uh, 2019 in Human Reproduction. As you can see, as I, as I told you before, the chance of an embryo to be euploid decreases between days. So from embryos of a day five with respect to day six or day seven, it decreases. And it decreases also according to maternal age at the moment of oocyte retrieval. But if we would stop our culture in day five, only 46% of our patients would obtain at least one transferable embryo because we would be missing all the euploid blastocysts in day six or day seven. If we extend culture to day six or even day seven, the rate of patients that could obtain at least one transferable embryo might get up to 89%. So this is to let you understand how important it is to extend culture in order to have more transferable embryos at the end of the day. Clearly these embryos would have a lower chance to implant because probably they would be less competent. So in a way we would reduce our overall efficiency per embryo transfer but the efficacy will be definitely higher because especially in some 
patients that would otherwise not obtain a live birth, we are rescuing some embryo uh, to uh, attempt to conceive. So the same concept that applies to poor quality blasters applies also to day seven. Overall, they are less competent, but in, the, in view of uh, the whole cycle, we are obtaining more live births at the end of the day. What about time lapse? Time lapse, as we know, it's a system in which we have an incubator, which is associated with a, uh, with a camera that is taking a picture every given uh, minutes in a way that we can then uh, build a video of the development of our embers up to the blastocyst stage. Uh, Armstrong in this Cochrane uh, was showed that overall uh, time lapse is not increasing our chance to uh, have a pregnancy at the end of the day. It's not by, it's, we use it as an incubator itself. It's not as in case we are using the parameters to predict live birth and so on. But still, I think that it might be an important instrument uh, for the lab. Some uh, studies attempted to see whether the time lapse parameters might be uh, predictive of Uprady. In this nice review by Pennetta, uh, well, you can see that some studies are showing some variable which is associated in their uh, data set with the chance of an embryo to be euploid. Some other studies, among which also the study by Laura Rienzi uh, from her group in 2015, showed no association between time lapse parameters and euploid. But the thing is that even if you look closely at these parameters that in some studies were found associated with Uprady, there is not a single parameter which is consistent among several studies. So in other terms, this is something I always care to stress. If something in IVF, but in science in general, is not reproducible and it's not consistent, we cannot apply it worldwide. We cannot consider it reliable. So what we tried to do instead was to go beyond uh, and see whether some time-lapse parameter might be associated together with Euplady, together to the fact that we already have a blastocyst in order to predict the chance of a euploid blastocyst to implant. We did this together with Marcos Mesege, that I know was your guest uh, last, uh, last week here. Uh, and uh, what we obtained, together with Marcos Mesege and Antonio Capalbo at iGenomics, what we obtained is that the time of myorulation if lower than 80 hours or higher than 80 hours, and the quality of the trophectum, if, if high or low, but not of the ICM, together were predictive of a chance of a, a euploid blastocyst to implant. In other terms, we have a live birth rate when, the, when we transfer a euploid embryo, which is about 41%. If the embryo uh, made the morula before 80 hours, it was of a high quality trophectum, we can get up to 62%. If the embryo made the morula beyond the 80 hours and the quality of the trophector was low, the chance of live birth was just 20%. So this is to tell you how the time-lapse parameters might increase our chance of uh, prediction upon implantation beyond UPLD. So probably we, can, we cannot substitute, we cannot replace the UPLD with the time-lapse, but we can try to use them both in order to predict the chance of an embryo to implant. The data were then validated, including also the European hospital, it's another IVF center in Rome, and the results were consistent. They were standardized among the centers, so we can consider them reliable, and we invite you to try to test this kind of uh, uh, results in your own centers. So I'm getting towards the end of the presentation. Now we talk about abnormal fertilization and aneuploidies. So we know that normally, and also the ASHER is suggesting, several guidelines in embryology are suggesting that we should use clinically only embryos that at day one after fertilization show two pronuclei, so the two PN embryos. And we should discard embryos that have only one pronucleus or more than two, so what we call the 2.1, so the ones that have two pronuclei and one smaller pronucleus, and clearly the 3 PN, so the embryos that show more than, uh, than two pronuclei. So what we did uh, in a study that we published together with, uh, again, iGenomics and uh, Dr. Treff, Dr. Scott uh, in, uh, in uh, RMA, New Jersey, was to try to test these embers, to include them, to rescue them for the clinical use. So as you can see, 1PN embryos here in black, in 6% of cases, more than 6% of cases, they can make a blastocyst. So the fact that they show only one pronucleus is not telling us that they, they are not viable. They can get to the blastocyst stage. 
the 2 pn, 2.1 pn, so the one with two pronuclei, one smaller pronucleus instead, has the same uh, chance to get to the blastic stage as normal 2 pn embryos here in uh, light gray. We didn't use the 3 pn because we were clearly scared of using them clinically. So we just focus on 1 pn and 2.1. So once these embryos got to the blastocyst stage, we performed a first line analysis by qPCR to see whether they were balanced. So they had the normal number uh, of uh, chromosomes, but we required a further analysis, a more advanced technique uh, to see the ploidy. So how many sets of chromosomes these embryos then actually had. So we use a leftover DNA. So some uh, DNA that uh, was uh, um, still uh, available after the qPCR analysis to perform SNP array or NGS and see how many sets of chromosomes uh, were uh, present among the balanced 1PN and 2.1PN. Uh, in other terms, we could define whether they were balanced haploid, balanced diploid, or balanced triploid. And clearly, we transferred only if the patients had only those embryos available, the balanced diploid ones. So this is just to show you what I am talking about. In time lapse, you can see this embryo that at the day one after fertilization, it clearly shows only one pronucleus that you can see here. So it was a one PN embryo. This embryo at the end of the day made a beautiful quality blastus, an excellent quality blastus is in day five. So we perform an embryo biopsy. We analyzed by qPCR this embryo. And as you can see, each of these single black bar stands for a chromosome from chromosome one up to chromosome X and Y. This blue is the threshold for monosomy. This red is the threshold for trisomy. So all these chromosomes were in between monosomy and trisomy. So the embryo was balanced male because it had only one chromosome X and one chromosome Y. So it was a balanced embryo. In this embryo there we, for, we will perform a further analysis on the leftover DNA to see whether it was deployed. And actually this one PN, PN embryo that you could see was clearly a one PN was deployed. Uh, we could see this by targeted NGS. Each of these single blue spot, it's a, a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism. If we have a, a deployed chromosomal constitution, we have three different possibilities because we have two alleles, AA, we might have a, a heterozygous AB and homozygous BB. So the different SNPs actually cover three lines. So we could in a way say that it was balanced, made, and it was a diploid embryo. In case it would have been haploid, so it had only uh, possibility to be A or B, we would be missing this kind of situation in the middle. So we could clearly see that this embryo, that was not the case for our embryo, would be haploid. In case instead it was triploid, we should expect to have four different bars because the situation would be four homozygous AAA, heterozygous BAA, heterozygous BBA, and a, a homozygous BBB. So as you can see, this is a situation that iGenomics in Italy is using uh, currently to uh, let us the chance to try to rescue this embryo for the clinical use. So in the paper that we published in Fertility and Sterility in 2017, eight out of 26 blastocysts that in six months uh, showed an abnormal fertilization and then get to the blastocyst stage, eight out of 26, so 30% of them were actually transferable. So we could rescue them for the clinical use. And otherwise we would have discarded these embryos in case we didn't have this kind of advanced genetic technologies to try to rescue them. Out of these eight embryos, we transferred six and we had three live births from patients that otherwise would not have conceived uh, differently. So I reached the conclusions. Uh, nowadays, what we can do in our clinical practice to try to predict live birth is that we can see the quality of the blastocyst. We can see the time lapse parameters, how the development of our embryo was. We can perform a biopsy on a trophectoderm and see through comprehensive chromosome testing techniques, whether the embryo is euploid or not. But even if we transfer, an excellent quality blastosis, which is euploid, and also at the perfect and ideal uh, development to that stage, our chance to predict implantation never goes beyond 
So there is still, I would say about 40% of uh, uh, what we call the black box of implantation. So there is still a lot of information missing on the embryos uh, that would probably in future increase our predictivity upon implantation. So what we like to conclude with is that nowadays we should take into account that an embryo to be considered competent uh, should respect at least three characteristics. It might be viable, which means that it should get to the blasted stage. It must be euploid, which means that it should have, it must have a um, diploid condition for all the chromosomes, apart from XY in case it is a male embryo. And then it must be competent, which means that it must be able to implant. Well, actually an embryo uh, might, be, might be viable, but not euploid. Uh, an embryo might be not viable, but euploid but it's pretty impossible apart from uh, vital trisomies and sex chromosome aneuploids that an aneuploid embryo would be competent. So we need a euploid blastocyst to have a live birth at the end of the day. The quality of the embryos, yes, it might increase in a way our chance of predictivity, but a lot of more information are required from the future that might come from epigenomics, they might come from transcriptomics, proteomics, myrnomics. We are also studying some of these aspects, mitochondrial DNA and risk uh, priority analysis from uh, uh, SNPs. And this is something that probably in the future will be interesting. And I thank you for your attention. I thank you for having me here. And I'm glad, I'm glad to take any question that uh, you would have. Um, Danilo, it was uh, very exciting, very challenging. Uh, presentation. I guess uh, that comes to my mind what we've uh, discussed before we were live with uh, all the guests yeah. is that uh, if you want to maintain a high, high implantation rate above 60%, probably we would lose uh, some, uh, some pregnancies, uh, yeah. especially for older women. Yeah. So uh, probably we need to take a look especially uh, in those patients which are uh, at least uh, in our practice, uh, which is very uh, similar to yours, uh, a lot of uh, uh, advanced maternal age. So I, I would like uh, to invite Natalia to make her comments. Uh, it, it was excellent, excellent presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Danilo, thank you very much. It was a great presentation, brilliant. I loved it. Um, I guess we have the recording and I'll keep that, I'll watch it over and over again. <laughs> very, very nice. Um, I have a couple of questions and we also have a question from the Q&A session and I'll open that also if more people want to ask questions, I can mediate there that. Uh, Danilo, one uh, question. When you have blastocyst expansion grade D, that we would call grade three, in, yeah. uh, according to Garner, uh, in the afternoon, you have a grade D expansion blastocyst. Many times, if you wait till the next morning, it will be a grade A or grade six. So you don't like to, to biopsy neither grade D nor grade A. So if you have in the afternoon a grade D and maybe in the next morning a grade A, what would but, you prefer? Uh, well, uh, I'll tell you that for our experience it's pretty uncommon that a grade D in the afternoon would be a grade A in the morning. So I'll tell you how we schedule, and maybe Roberta also can uh, confirm this, how we schedule our daily workload. We normally have two sessions for the biopsies. So one, it's about after the, all the pickups in the morning. So it's about 11, 12 o'clock in the morning. And then just before going home, there is a second session for the biopsies in which we see whether some embryo must be biopsied in that moment that probably was not ready yet in the morning. So we try to, we try to prevent uh, obviously that an embryo would, uh, would be uh, beyond the full expanded stage and it would be arching or fully arched in the day afternoon by having a second section of bi session of biopsies at 4, 5 p.m. In the, in the afternoon before going home. So in this way, we try to prevent these kind of situations. But if I have to choose, I would prefer an embryo 
which is uh, uh, fully hatched rather than embryo not expanded yet. Because, you know, the fact is that we also notice that the risk not to get a diagnosis is even higher if you biopsy an embryo that is still very small, is not still fully expanded, because the risk of uh, having the same, vo in the same volume of the biopsy, you might have less cells at the end of the day, because the cells, the trophetan cells are bigger. Yes. So, you know, and then you might have the risk of having to re biopsy that embryo and that might be a, an issue in a way for, uh, for the blaster. So we always prefer to wait a little bit more and take the risk for a fully arch rather than biopsy an embryo that is not yet fully expanded. So this is a, uh, a suggestion that, that, that we will give you. Thank you. I have another question. Um, do you ever consider not biopsying a uh, blastocyst? And do you talk that with the patient if you have a very poor quality blast and maybe in any situation would you talk it over with the patient so as not to biopsy this embryo? Or no, mm. once it's a PGTA cycle, you biopsy? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know what? The, mm, as I, as I told you before, the thing is that it's a very peculiar situation because we cannot, uh, uh, in any case, we cannot discard this embryo. So they must be vitrified in any case. Mm -hmm. So if it is a PGT cycles, these embryos uh, uh, would be biopsied, they would be vitrified because as we saw, there is no higher risk not to get a diagnosis. So uh, most of the cycles, PGT cycles, for sure, they will be free zoled. So these embryos are going to be vitrified in any case. So we prefer clearly biopsying them rather than uh, freezing them and maybe in the future you would need to, to warm it mm -hmm. and, and then we, and then, then vitrify it again, it would be worse for the embryo rather than uh, biopsying it straight uh, away in that moment. So it might be in some cases uh, that since we have, you know, a good package in terms of payment for the patients up to six embryos, up to six blastocysts, it might be that if the poor quality embryo is the seventh embryo, it might be vitrified without biopsy rather than the other good or excellent quality ones. So that might be just a very rare situation in which we want, bi we want biopsy a poor quality embryo, but normally we do it. Okay, and my last question. Um, in real life, when you don't have a time-lapse system and you don't have your genomics to do the ploidy test, when you have one PN uh, blastocysts. I mean, you don't have a time lapse. You're not really sure. You can't tell for sure that it's a 1 p.m. And then you have on day five a beautiful blastocyst. What do you do with it if you don't have a time lapse, a time lapse to check? And uh, eGenomics won't perform the ploidy test. Would you discard it? Would you? Well, uh, you mean when you miss? the moment of uh, fertilization, that the, the, the pronuclei already disappeared? No, when you see a 1 p.m. Ah, you saw, you saw the 1 p.m. You no, saw no, no. 1 p.m. You know, if, if you saw a 1 p.m. and you have no advanced genetic technologies to use, I would, you know, discourage using these embers because there is no way we can, uh, I mean, it, it's not worth taking the risk. Uh, that an embryo, you know, if it is a haploid, it's less risky than a triploid. Uh, clinical mm -hmm. wise for, for the gestation, I mean, and the risks involved, but still I would not suggest using this embryo. At least these are also the guidelines from ASHRA and we, you know, we agree with them. Okay. Uh, and we have a question here from the Q&A session. When do you consider a 2 p.m. plus a 1 small different p.m.? How do you distinct a 3 p.m. from a 2 p.m. plus 1? Maybe Roberta will take this question. She will be more accurate than me in answering. Yes. Uh, so we only consider those uh, uh, zygotes that shows uh, two regular pronuclei with uh, one small pronucleus, one with uh, uh, one nuclei inside. So it's just uh, uh, a putative fragmentation. Maybe we may consider it like, like a fragmentation of the uh, pronucleus more than uh, a third uh, pronucleus. So that's the reason why we, we, we consider them. We exclude the, the, those all sites that show uh, clearly uh, three pronuclei. Okay. Um, 
I'll pass no, it I, over. I, you know, I want, I want to stress one thing. Uh, clearly, uh, the situation of uh, uh, including and rescuing abnormally fertilized oocytes is not easy also in terms of management, clinical management, because you need a very form of counseling and uh, it's very important for the gynecologist to, to explain this to the patient. So we are trying to suggest this kind of rescuing to those patients that really need these embryos. Maybe in case it is just the only blastocysts they produce or they are very poor prognosis, the risk of aneuploidy is very high, so we tend to rescue these embryos. But if you have a 1PN embryo that gets to blastocyst stage in a patient that already made six blastocysts and she's 35, I mean, you know, it's not worth doing it. The balance between the cost and the benefit is not that high. So it's not a common practice. It's something that we are, at least for the moment, uh, it's dedicated for some peculiar population of patients. So this is important to stress. Okay. Uh, Renata, Dr. Rafaela, Dr. Selma, anyone? Would you like to ask something? Renata, Renata Bossi. It's, it's, it's your turn. <laughs> uh, I would like to uh, uh, thank you for sharing your, your knowledge and uh, excellent lecture. And I, I would like to know if you have some experience with reverse cleavage embryos and pregnancy rates with these embryos, blastocyst quality. Well, uh... That's something I've always had in mind to study. So together with, with Roberta and the other, the other embryologists in the lab, it's something we're, we're really willing to look into uh, because, you know, with, we have both the embryoscope and the Gary, so we have a lot of embryos uh, that uh, we can look at every day. And uh, so a, a, an ad hoc study on that might be interesting. But unfortunately, I still don't have our own data from Genera to look at that. But if you see some data uh, in the literature, uh, there is a lot of studies that show that if you have a reverse cleavage, the risk of that embryo to be aneuploid is higher, especially if you look that embryo at the cleavage stage. But in most of cases, these embryos that undergo very abnormal cleavage patterns, they arrest their development in day three. So as soon as the embryonic genome gets activated. So it seems that in a way, this kind of abnormal cleavage is mirroring a, a very important issue in terms of chromosomal uh, uh, segregation during uh, the, the migration of the chromosomes in the division. <clears throat> the point is that if an embryo that had a reverse cleavage can make it to get to the blastocyst stage, so it gets beyond the embryonic genome activation in day three, so it doesn't arrest at the cleavage stage, then it might have the same euploidy rate and chance of implantation of any other embryo that didn't go, that didn't undergo a reverse cleavage or any other kind of uh, abnormal cleavage pattern. So my suggestion is that if you get, if you have an embryo that after a reverse cleavage can make it to the blastocyst stage, probably, but again, I don't have our own data to say that it's just literature, uh, research, literature information. Uh, maybe it might have the same competence as any other embryo. So that, that's something we, we, we should look into in the future and uh, really willing to see. But that's our, at least this is what literature is saying. Mm -hmm. These are embryos that, that normally they cannot make it beyond the day three, but if they can make it, probably they are as viable as any other embryo. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, just another question. Uh, we know that freeze for embryo quality is a difficult uh, for us, is a challenge. And also day five and the six zone free is difficult for us. And yeah. Uh, I would like to know if you have an advice or a suggestion, a protocol modification. What do you suggest? So we have this paper that we published uh, in Numa Reproduction in 2018. It was a paper that we, a study that we did together with the Humanitas Center in Milan. It's a, it's, it's a big center also in Italy. Uh, so we analyzed several vitrification and warming cycles in order to perform single embryo transfer. And what we notice is that, yes, you're, you're right when you say that uh, uh, zona-free embryos are more difficult to be, uh, to be vitrified and warmed. Uh, but normally, this is not affecting 
the degeneration or cry survival rate, it's mainly affecting the risk that they won't re-expand one hour and a half after warming. So it might have an, an effect in that kind of, of, of situation. The other thing that we notice is that uh, um, if you uh, shrink, artificially shrink the embryo with a laser shot uh, before uh, vitrifying, they tend to survive better to warming. So this is something that we notice uh, in our center, in the center in, um, in the center in Milan, that they, they were already performing laser assisted artificial shrinkage, uh, which is implicit if you perform PGT, because you know, if you take out the trophectoderm, uh, you use the laser, it will shrink. So what we are trying to do nowadays is that we tend to vitrify the embryos within 30 minutes, maximum one hour from biopsy, so that they won't re-expand. We tend to vitrify embryos that are still enclosed in the zona. And in non-PGT cycles, we perform artificial shrinkage with a laser shot before vitrifying. And this might be helpful in, uh, in trying to increase a little bit more uh, the, the cryo survival rate, which is still about 97%, but you can get up to 99. So this is our experience. So since we published this paper in 2018 and uh, we are using it systematically nowadays, the artificial shrinkage in non-PGT cycles to shrink the embryos before vitrifying them. Okay, thank you. So if you, if you want, Roberta was the first name of a paper we published last year in the Journal of Visual Experiments and in which we are showing in a video paper. So you have also the video, both the biopsy and the vitrification protocol that we are using nowadays and how we validated and implemented it. Uh, so you can have a look to that paper and uh, it might, might be interesting. Nice, thanks. Roberta, could you tell us a bit about the, um, the situation in the lab now? If, how you're working, how you're de dealing with patients during this pandemic? Yes, so we, have, uh, just, uh, we are just trying to, to restart uh, uh, with our treatment in uh, this uh, uh, lockdown phase, we have uh, uh, just included uh, um, urgent treatment. So patients that need, uh, uh, for instance, fertility preservation for uh, oncological reasons, or because they have to do to have a toxic therapies. Um, but at the moment, we are going to restart uh, all the, the 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 IVF treatment uh, according to. Um, the recommendation that been published yesterday by the uh, ASHRAE on the ASHRAE website. So uh, at the moment we are uh, uh, we have decided to to um, include only patients uh, and uh, that are uh, negative to the um, triage pre, to the pre IVF triage for uh, uh, COVID nineteen. Uh, so only uh, patients without uh, uh, symptoms. And we decide to exclude uh, uh, patients uh, with uh, pre-existing clinical uh, diseases such as uh, hypertension or um, uh, clinical problems uh, such as uh, um, uh, liver disease because uh, the higher risk of uh, uh, complication uh, due to the uh, COVID-19 emergency. So at the moment, uh, we're going to start, we're going to give priority to patients that have uh, advanced maternal age or poor ovarian reserve, and the patients that need uh, for uh, an urgent treatment uh, because of uh, a delicate uh, psychological situation. So we're going to give a priority to these patients, but we're going to start also with uh, uh, the other treatments. So the idea is to reduce, to minimize the risk by performing uh, um, an accurate tri uh, triage, pre-IVF triage to our patients uh, and also to, our, uh, uh, to all uh, the staff. So uh, the idea is to uh, perform a, a triage in three different moments of the, of the cycle. Uh, the moment of the, of the uh, consultation, the first consultation when uh, the, the patients uh, um, are provided with a, an accurate uh, counseling, a proper counseling in order to be informed about the risk of the, of the procedure. Uh, they, um, and uh, they uh, ask, uh, we ask them uh, if they want to proceed or postpone uh, the, the, the treatment. 
Uh, then we perform a second uh, triage at the moment of, uh, in the moment in which they start the ovarian stimulation, and the third triage is performed uh, the day before the, uh, the ovarian, the, the oocyte retrieval. So uh, in this case, uh, we, we in, this, in this way, we try to, to minimize the, the risk, and uh, if the patients uh, show any specific symptoms, uh, we perform a serological screening for uh, COVID-19, in case of positivity, we ask them to postpone the, the treatment because we don't want to, to, to increase the risk uh, due to the emergency of the, of the COVID-19. What so about the, the lab, staff? In the lab, we are the, the staff. Uh, is, uh, we, we ask the staff to, to have the same, uh, um, the same path. So, so we, we perform a triage uh, we have, we have divided, divided the, uh, all the, the embryologists into different teams. Um, so it's the same uh, uh, schedule that we have for the weekend. So we have two different group of embryologists. So in, uh, we can uh, uh, be uh, sure that we have embryologists working if uh, uh, one of the, the embryologists of the group uh, gets sick. And we ask them to, um, to have the same path that uh, we ask for uh, our patients. So they, we perform a, a, a triage uh, one week before starting the, the, the clinical activity. And in case of symptom, we uh, perform a serological screening for, uh, uh, for COVID, uh, the, for uh, IgG and IgM uh, um, screening. Okay, thank you. Dr. Marcelo? I'm gonna, I'm gonna just uh, leave the, the, the opportunity for Dr. Rafaela to ask any questions to both uh, our guests. Hello, everybody. First of all, I would like to congratulate you for your class. It was very good and clearly, but my SK already was responded in the initial of this discussion. And not necessarily do a question now, but what we discussed here today showed that the laboratory performance can also be individualized. And it's very good to, to understand these details here. Thank you very much for their presentation. Yeah, you know, that, that's something that we, uh, as I told you before, the point is that in Italy, we cannot still adopt this kind of situation because we are, we are forced to use any viable embryo. Uh, but we felt it was important to publish those data uh, about poor quality embryos, but in general about embryos that might be discarded because for poor prognosis patients or patients that are in their last chance of conceiving with their own eggs, uh, they might be important to, to give the chance to any possible embryo that, uh, that can uh, putatively give rise to a live birth. So, Clearly, all, all these data do not apply to the general IVF population, do not apply to young patients with good chances. Uh, but as you, as you, as you uh, importantly stressed in your question, in your comment, uh, as for the ovarian stimulation, it should be as much individualized as possible. Probably also the way we approach the embryos with respect to the patient we deal with must be in a way individualized. So this is something that we, as embryologists, we should always keep in mind it's important. Never do the things just by default because they must be done in that way by, but, but consider any embryo as a potential life birth when we deal with them. Thank you. Uh, uh, I think the most important, uh, the message that Dr. Rafaela has said, it's very, very important. We need to individualize our treatments, not just yeah. uh, in terms of medication, but also in the lab. Yeah. And uh, I have mentioned this before, that uh, what we are focusing at, I mean, uh, we just uh, want to have good results or do we want to offer the best treatment for each patient? So that's a huge debate. When I see uh, amazing implantation rates, over 60% in many publications, probably they are losing some pregnancies, not offering biopsy or even transfer for low prognostic embryos. Yeah. So definitely it opens uh, our view today. You know, that, 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 that's the, I think the biggest bias in, uh, in IVF in general is that if you show the data only per embryo transfer, uh, it does not apply only to PGT. It applies to any kind of thing we do in our daily practice. So 
if you show the data only per embryo transfer, you're missing a lot of the story. Uh, so we always need to, to, to give an idea of whatever we do and to assess the efficacy of whatever we do per intention to treat at least per oocyte retrieval, so not just per embryo transfer, uh, because clearly then the implantation rate might rise up to 60%. But in our daily practice, we never see implantation rates like that. We always have about 40, 45% live birth rate when we transfer euploid blastocysts. So this is something that uh, we should always keep in mind, especially you Brazilians as us, that we share in a way the population of patients we treat uh, on average, uh, which are older than 38 or 38.5 years old of uh, maternity. So I think we share our view in this. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very reassuring, Danilo, hearing you. And uh, it's also good, as uh, you, you've mentioned, and you published so many things about this, and a large cohort of patients, a large cohort of embryos analyzed, that we need to focus on our patient, not just on, on our statistics. So yeah. that's my point of view. As a doctor, I, I always focused on, on my patients. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Danilo, thank you so much. I would like to to thank you, congratulate you, uh, amazing uh, presentation. Also, uh, thanks uh, Roberta for her, for her talk and her presence, for you to share your time, spend your time in such a difficult thank situation so as, as we're all uh, being through right now. Thank you, thank you so much. I cannot express my gratitude to you too, okay? Thank you. It was, and, uh, it was a honor. It was a honor for us, and uh, I mean, we look forward to coming physically in Brazil, maybe next time. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. I hope to see you soon, uh, physically. And uh, uh, as today is a Friday uh, in the evening here, I'm going to drink a, uh, Italian wine. Good. Just to Good honor you too, and uh, the, your <laughs> country and your people, okay? We'll do the same. And uh, I'm going to share uh, with all our guests also, the invitation for our next uh, international webinar. Uh, we are close friends uh, with uh, Marcos Messeger. And the next week, uh, we are going to talk about uh, artificial, artificial intelligence and uh, time lapse, which is nice. going to be next Friday at the same time. Uh, Danilo, we just received uh, two incubators from Jerry. Uh, they came out uh, as the uh, first time in Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we were able to have this uh, incubator through uh, our research project, which has uh, been approved here. Uh, we were supposed to install those incubators in the month of uh, April, but with the pandemic, we we're not able to do so. So we are hoping to start our uh, clinical trial. And uh, Marcos, was, uh, next week, is going to talk about artificial intelligence and uh, yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. get a some answers uh, and uh, make a combination with the data that you showed today. Yeah, sure, sure. Well, thank Marcos is, is the master of time lapse and, and, and now yeah. he's, he's working on, on AI, so I'm sure it would be an extremely interesting meeting. Okay, thank you, thank you all. Have thank a good, you. great thank evening you so in, in Italy. Thank you, you all. Too. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank bye. Bye-bye.